so I think uh, let's get started. Uh, well, so today I am going to talk a little bit about uh, user experience in open source and let's uh, talk about uh, testing. So uh, my name is Santiago Zarate, I am a QA engineer at SUSE. Uh, I work as a backend developer for OpenQA. Um, so the first thing is why this talk? Uh, this, this is not a technical talk, this is a talk just to talk about why we find over and over again the same people or different type of, types of user asking questions in Stack Overflow on uh, sometimes we see them in GitHub issues that they are asking, hey, I found this problem, what is happening here? And then there is all these same people telling them all over and over again, go read the manual, you did something wrong, you don't have the right application installed, go to the, go to the console uh, and run these commands, try to do this or try to do that, and then the user ends up spending, I don't know, maybe half an hour, one hour, even days, trying to do one simple thing. And this is, the problem with this is that sometimes these kind of users are potential contributors because if they are, if they want to install one application, if they are taking the time to go to talk to you, if they are taking the time to write somewhere, hey, I need some support here, maybe it's because they have a real interest and if they are trying to, uh, if they are coming back all the time and saying, hey, I tried your solution, but it didn't work. I tried this, but it didn't work. It, it means perhaps that there is something missing somewhere in between. And this is where the user interaction comes into play. Uh, and it's not user interaction. It's also user experience. Uh, the user experience, uh, will always unravel how awesome of a developer you are. It will uh, simplify the need to explain. The better the interaction you have within your application, the better your, uh, your interaction is with the user, the less you have to explain, the less text you have to write. It also enhances the credibility of the developers that created uh, this piece of software. So for the next time that the user uh, tries to upgrade the application, the user is just going to, to see this and say, hmm, maybe I will just upgrade because I really think that the developers are caring about me. They care about my time and I also would like to try to contribute back to them. So. Uh, let's add the word revenue because I just need a buzzword here. Uh, if you read the first letter, it just says user, which is the main focus here. Uh, we just want to, sometimes when, you are, when, when we are writing software, we just want to make our users happy. If you are just uh, the sole and the lone, the lone user of your application, perhaps you don't really need uh, any type of users or nobody telling you, hey, this is going wrong. Therefore, your application might just not grow. Your application might just not get better. Uh, and this will just make anybody not wanting to use your application, your software. Um, and this is all about getting feedback and bringing all the users into the yard, sharing with them, talking to them, trying to make sure that whatever they feel that they need, if it makes sense, you can implement it, you can add it, so that they feel that they are hurt and they will use uh, your applications a little bit more. They will try to contribute even more. Uh, this can be by tutorials, uh, reporting bugs. We all know the story here. This might sound like a BS bingo, but it's really not. Uh, I guess everybody here has ever heard of LibreOffice and GIMP. So <coughs> GIMP, GIMP in particular, uh, they started to hear their user base. In the beginning, it was 
this interface with only one big square where you will draw, and, and which was your main workspace, and then these two bars on the side. Over time, they found somebody who was willing to take the burden of sitting down, listening to the users, coming up with design, uh, with interaction design, coming up with new UI, and then since version 2.8, I think, you also have a new um, user interface in, in GIMP that you can just select and you can change. So they started to listen and to take their user base more into account. Uh, they also came up with new ideas uh, and a good project vision. They don't want to be the replacement of Adobe Photoshop. They want to be one of the best uh, image editing software available that is free and that is open source. This is their project goal. And they are trying to achieve this by listening to their users, improving the user interaction, improving the UX writing. Because it's not just making sure that the user is doing less clicks, it's also making sure that the user understands better uh, with less information when he's trying to interact with the application. Uh, and they are also providing no a uh, very good roadmap. <clears throat> and here, roadmap is the key. As soon as you start giving the users a roadmap, they feel like, OK, so I know when to expect something in particular, if there is a roadmap at all. Uh, they started with this roadmap, uh, I think, five, five years ago or something like this, and they have been improving over time. And if you go back into the diff on the wiki, you can see that they are just adding more and more features, and they are changing the release dates. They are working now towards version 2.10, and they are almost halfway through it. Uh, now we have the LibreOffice part. Uh, I think we all have used LibreOffice at one point. In fact, I am, I am using LibreOffice right now. Um, if anybody remembers any version before 5.4, 5, 5, they were just difficult to use. So, but over time, again, over time they started to work on their UI, on their UX. They came up with a very, very amazing document on how to create uh, new dialogues, how to design the interaction with the user, how to design every single uh, UI component. And the people from the Gino uh, GNOME Foundation is also doing something very similar. So they are investing in making sure that the users, that the people that is actually using their application actually feel encouraged to use it. because. I think nobody wants to use something that just simply looks horrible. Um, one thing, also one other thing, is that they have a very well documented QI process. Uh, between, in between all of the open source community, communities that I know, LibreOffice and Mozilla have the best documentation when it comes to QA. They even have a, a small document on how users can do git bisection. So, and it's like four or five lines uh, of, of a document where somebody who wants to do some bisection just can sit down even without knowing uh, because they are just running a bunch of scripts. And all they need, all the people from LibreOffice need, is just somebody to run those for them. <laughs> just, uh, and they are always and continuously empowering users to give feedback. They are always telling them, if you find an error, if you find a problem, please go and report it. They open a, a Telegram channel, they have their IRC, IRC channels, and they have a very active community also on Twitter, and they also have their own Ask application. Uh, and there is a very big user base. Also, there is a lot of developers, and there is a lot of money involved. The main, the main thing here is that the more you give to the users, the more you involve the users into your process, the better your application is going to be. Uh, also, they have their release plans 
and they have a very clear release criteria. This is, again, just means to an end, just giving users the possibility to contribute, even to say, hey, maybe this point of the release criteria is just not right, let's move it before or let's move it after. Uh, this is one of the screenshots of the release map for six, version 6.1. Six uh, and again, roadmap here is the key. The release criteria is also the key. And empowering the user is also key for, uh, for communities. Without empowering users, we cannot do, we cannot grow. And now, if we sit down and we try to mix what I've been talking with what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so it has to do with everything. Uh, if we sit down and we start to think, who's using actually the software? We have AI now using software. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have a, an Amazon Echo or a Google Assistant or use any of these things. Uh, but internally, there is there is some software that is running there. Uh, obviously, humans are using software. Uh, we also have animals. Uh, that picture from there is uh, is the project of a guy, some engineer that decided to hack on his Raspberry Pi a very small. Um, image recognition software, so that when the cat was standing in the door, it will open the door, just so that the cat can enter. So, again, it's not just a person that is sitting behind a computer, it's anything that can interact with the system. And obviously, we have robots as well, because, you know, uh, both on dynamics and stuff. So, just imagine a world where you cannot your applications cannot interoperate. So we cannot have Google making a call to um, a hairdresser and then giving the, f the feedback back to the user that, that started all the thing. Uh, imagine a world where you cannot install applications. Uh, I guess you have heard of serverless. Uh, this thing that well, no, basically nothing is, you, you distribute nothing, you code nothing, you install nothing. I think it, it went somewhere, somewhere along those lines. Uh, I don't think it works for applications and for end users. End users need to install something. And right now you have Flatpak, for example. And Flatpak works amazing. Uh, actually, the LibreOffice that I have, I'm running Gentoo here, and I install it through Flatpak. Easy peasy. Uh, the thing is that you need to install the installer. So there is something there. Um, then just imagine that you have a world where you cannot improve applications, that you cannot say, hey, I found a bug, I need a, I need a fix here. So that's why we have things like Windows where we need to wait for ages before things are solved. And then we have the world where applications aren't known. Uh, there is a lot of amazing software running out there, free, publicly available, but either people don't know about this software, people don't, don't use this software, but this is because nobody is using it. And nobody uses it because either they cannot install it, because they cannot uh, give feedback to the, to the creators, or because simply you cannot, in, in, uh, you cannot interact with the software. So, you know, software is left forever alone. At one point, you might think that this is ridiculous, there is no such world, but uh, many of us have tried to install at least uh, one of the two next applications, and on top of that, Eclipse, I think. So the first one is Genie. Uh, if I want to install Genie right now on my computer, uh, I just need to, okay, so let's say I don't know anything about Linux, so I go online, text editor, Linux, 
among the first results, one is going to be Atom, the other is going to be, uh, I think, Gini, and there are like three others that are also going to come. Sublime Text is also one of them. So for Gini, I just need one click to get the information on how to install it, and I get the, the actual instructions. It's just very easy, even for Gentoo. Uh, if I want to use Atom, for Atom, I need one click as well. Just download the RPM or download the dev. And nowadays, most distributions are already integrated. So if I download a dev, uh, dot dev or an RPM, I can already install it. There is not much there. So it's easy for me as a user. But on the other hand, if I need other binaries, like for Windows, I just click uh, in other platforms, and it takes me to GitHub, and I can download the X file. But on the other hand, we have Eclipse. So for Eclipse, first, I, go to the we I went to the website. I click Download. And the first thing I get is a Torvald. Who is installing a Torvald in 2018? That is not a packager or that is not running, I don't know, Slackware or Gentoo. And even for, for Gentoo, there, is, uh, there are ways to not use uh, Torvald. Uh, so you also need more clicks to get to the instructions on how to install it. And then on top of that, if you are going to develop for Java, you need a specific version of Java. If you are going to develop C++, you need a specific version of the, of the Eclipse uh, um, this, um, Torvald. And it depends on what you're going to do with it, what you can download. And then it says, yeah, well, you can have it, and you can download it through your distribution if it's packaged. And I don't really know anybody who is uh, using Eclipse uh, in these times, but I th it sounds really painful to use it. And the problem is that for most software that is out there, usually the instructions that are built are built only for the developer who created this because he's not thinking or she's not thinking about redistributing the software. It's just like, okay, so let me put it on GitHub and whoever wants to install it, they can go through the pain of installing this software. And well, yeah, it makes sense if you don't really want to improve. It does make sense if you want more people to use your application. <laughs> so uh, what's, the, what's my point with all of this? Uh, again, going back to the previous slide, just imagining a world where users are just downloading a tarball, and let's say this is one of those users that doesn't really know how to use a, a terminal. So they don't know even how to use a tar minus XVC and then the name of the file. So when they see this, they don't even know where to put this. Of course, yes, you can say, you can tell the user, go and read the manual, take a look, see how to install applications, see how to do this, see how to do that. But then again, you are going to have the same user coming to you again in the next week, perhaps, saying, hey, I was trying this. I tried the whole week, and I don't really understand how to install this application. And if any of us have ever asked their parents or their family, somebody from the family, hey, just run Linux, you know the type of questions they can come up with. And again, this is all about user experience. Uh, you need to write... I, I would really like to recommend just people to write documentation that is clear, that have instructions. That, uh, sometimes the user, when they go to the Getting Started Guide, they are not looking for the philosophical story on why you should use Bash instead of ZSH, or vice versa. They are looking for the specific command that is going to allow them to run that application. So write something 
in the getting started guide that is basically saying, okay, run this command, and that's it. If that doesn't work, then go to the troubleshooting guide or go to this place and ask, which is kind of easier for the user to understand rather than trying to figure out why is it not working on the distribution that they, they are using. <laughs> you also need to listen to, the, to your user base. If you are always having those users coming to you and telling you, hey, I am trying to do this in this distribution and it doesn't work, there is something going on, going on there. So improve perhaps the installation, uh, the installation guide. Improve perhaps the guide where you are guiding the user where and how to configure one part of the service. Allow, them, allow the users to collaborate, because maybe there are some, uh, some users that have a lot, of, a lot of technical knowledge, so they sit down and they do it by themselves. And they can just simply sit down and say, okay, so I was trying to do A, I did it, and then no, I want to, somebody else to use A again. I, can, I want somebody else to not go through my pain so that they can just simply leave and go on with their lives. And of course, you need to test. You need to make sure that whatever you are putting there works. You need to make sure that whatever you are distributing works. And you need to make sure that whatever the user is trying to do will work. Or if it doesn't, there is an error and he, and he or she understands that there is a problem, that there is something that failed and that there is something that has to be done. So, if you still don't follow, what's the point? The point is that you actually need to test. You need to make sure that your documentation is up to date. Because if you don't update your documentation from the last three years, and then suddenly, I don't know, there is a new version of uh, the programming language that you are using to build the uh, to build the software, you might end up with users telling you, hey, this is not compiling. And if you, again, if you don't test the documentation, you cannot, uh, you cannot know or you cannot catch these kind of problems. And this you can automate. You can actually, if you are using, for example, Markdown, you can just simply write a parser, take out everything that is outside, uh, take out take out everything that is outside a code block, execute only the code blocks, and you can do this in an automated way. And it will take, I don't know, 10 minutes. Then it's just about listening to your, to your user base. You can crowdsource, crowdsource, so set up mailing lists, set up forums, uh, set up maybe not as many things as you can, but what you can actually afford. Uh, if you can afford a Twitter account and a mailing list, then great. Just let the users know that it's there. Sometimes certain users don't think that the, something has support just because they don't find an email address or a Twitter account or a Telegram account nowadays, even a Facebook account. So it depends on how much you want the users to actually engage you. <coughs> also empower them to take part in your process. Allow them to sit down and say, hey, you know, the last version of the software that you released has a lot of bugs, uh, and I really would like to help because this is becoming important for me. So just allow them to do that work. Many of us here work uh, already in one or two um, big uh, pieces of software, uh, and maybe one of one of uh, one or many of us have written at one point something that is being used by somebody else, even if it, if it's a small thing. And as soon as somebody else is using that, as as soon as they are allowed to to give you review, to give you a review, to give you feedback on whatever the, whatever they are using, how they are using it. If you take that into account, you incorporate that into your software, it's going to empower them and it's going to allow them to say, hey, maybe there is something here. Maybe I can keep 
still doing things here. And they can, you know, stick around for a little bit more. And of course, it's about uh, making sure that the process is working. So again, about empowering the users, well, I still don't follow. So uh, let's go back to this one. Uh, so LibreOffice, right? Uh, they are sharing uh, some things. They are sharing a, a roadmap. So if you are a, a, a developer and you want to, I don't know, plan some work, share it. At least share what are your ideas. You don't need to come up with dates. You don't need to come up with very detailed uh, information on how to do stuff or what to do, what to implement. Just the big idea at Think Tank and then start to slowly chop, chop it down into very small parts. Uh, and then, of course, take feedback from your users. If a user is telling you, hey, maybe this is just not going to work or whatever you are planning there is not going to work for me, well, sit down, listen, see how you can improve. Make sure that you uh, make clear the release criteria. When do you think that the software is ready for, use, for, for being used? Maybe for me, the software is, is already being used. It's usable when the software is passing all the tests that I wrote. Or when I go to my specific use case, it doesn't crash. It gives me the error when it should, so everything is fine. That's my release criteria. But maybe the user doesn't know. A user doesn't know it. A user doesn't know when a nightly build is ready is ready to be used. A user doesn't know when the um, beta build is going to be considered like a really good uh, candidate. So if you make that public, if you share it, maybe perhaps a user can say, OK, uh, I think I can get to an early stage and start to push for something to be fixed because I found a problem. Because maybe the way we are testing is not the same way as the users are actually taking the application and, you know, crashing it because that's what users do. Uh, and obviously, you need to write some documentation, decent documentation, and always try to improve it. It's not just the software that needs refactoring, but you also, from time to time, need to refactor your own documentation because it gets defaced. At one point, if you don't touch it, if you don't go back to it, I don't know, uh, six months, one year into the future, somebody's going to come and tell you, do you know, this is just not working for me, so uh, what can we do? Uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh,